Good afternoon. Uh, we're here today in the, the second of a series of five uh, webinars on, on housing and your living standard. And just so you know where we are today, we're on how much house can we afford? And next month, August 25th, we'll be talking about should we buy a vacation house on September 8th? And I'm going to add that September 8th is a changed date. So please take a look at the date that you have. It's now September 8th. It was the 15th, okay? Should we downsize or dream size? And then in October, can you count on the value of your home? And all of these are still available. You can sign up for any one of them. Um, as usual, um, after Rick finishes his presentation, uh, Rick Miller, the president and CNC, CEO of Sensible Financial, who I forgot to introduce, will finish his presentation and then he'll be here to answer questions. So if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Okay, thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Carrie, and welcome everyone. As Carrie indicated, this afternoon we're going to talk about how much house can we afford? But before we do that, I'd like to present or to outline the key takeaways from the whole series. And I'm repeating them each time, but they're, uh, they're important. And if they are the points that I would like you to walk away with from the series as a whole. So first of all, housing is a riskier investment than you might think. Uh, it is a fixed investment. And because it's fixed, we don't think about it that often. But because it's such a large investment and such a large part of what we spend our resources on, it's very important to your living standard. The lifetime balance sheet is an essential perspective as it allows us to put everything that we spend money on in the same metric. And in general, housing is difficult and different from many expenses that we have, in that, especially if you buy, it's a lumpy investment. It's a stock, whereas almost all of the other things that we spend money on are flows. They happen regularly, every week, every month. When you buy a house, you're putting out a very large amount of money, and in effect, you're prepaying many, many, many months of expenses. And so comparing that one large expenditure to large and and for a long period of time expenditure to smaller and shorter period of time expenditures is very difficult. And anything that we can do to make those expenditures commensurate is helpful. So the lifetime balance sheet allows us to take lots of short term or monthly expenses, let's say, and put them into a lifetime perspective. Alternatively, we can take housing and translate it into a monthly perspective so that we can compare it to other expenses that we think of in that way. And I really encourage you to do that when you're thinking about making a housing decision. Many of our housing expenses are irregular if we own, and those are major maintenance expenses. And in general, we tend to underestimate those. And so we tend to underestimate the cost of owning a home. And finally, even though, as I've said, housing is a, is a chunk, it's a, a lumpy expenditure, you can still uh, modulate that expenditure by tapping your home equity. And, and therefore, you can calibrate the impact of owning a home on the rest of your financial plan. So let's move on to this week's topic, which is how much house can we afford? And as we're thinking about this in the context of retirement, I wanted to emphasize that housing in retirement is somewhat different than housing when you are uh, earlier in your life. Uh, and there are a number of considerations that, that make it different. Uh, one floor living is likely to be desirable later in retirement. You may need help during this part of your life with various activities, and will your home facilitate that? Um, your capabilities will change as you age, and your housing decision has to recognize that. And it's important to plan for the changes. Uh, 
Physical changes are uh, somewhat obvious, but changes in emotional energy, I think, are, are less obvious. And as people get older, they have less emotional energy, and it becomes more uh, difficult to undertake large changes. And finally, uh, I want to encourage uh, flexibility without nimbleness. And what I mean by that is a solution to many problems that's flexible. Uh, one house that could accommodate changing capabilities uh, or something like a continuing care retirement community, which we're not going to talk about any further today, but which is, if you will, something, it really epitomizes flexibility without requiring nimbleness. We're going to, again, work with the Robinsons uh, throughout today's discussion. We met them in the last webinar. Uh, they're intending to leave their family home for a new home in retirement. They earn a comfortable living and they don't have to worry about their children. <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me, we're, we're leaving aside a lot of considerations that are frequently important uh, for families who are making this decision so that we can focus on that, the housing decision by itself. And the Robinsons have decided that uh, downsizing does not appeal to them. They want uh, a, a bigger house. They want to go for the gusto, I say. And, and gusto has a special meaning for everyone. I'm sure it has uh, a special meaning for you. I've listed a few of the things that uh, an expensive house might represent or might uh, provide for, for you. Uh, but there are other considerations as well that may be important to you. And, the, uh, we're going to focus here on the expense, but the expense is for a reason, and it's, it's usually for something that's important to you. And in addition to wanting a more expensive house, they don't want to reduce their living standard. They want to keep spending what they're spending. And as we think about the Robinsons, we want to think about uh, or want to understand a little bit more about uh, their financial situation. And they're putting a lot of their income into their 401ks. In fact, they're putting as much as they can in their 401ks. Uh, they have substantial 401ks already. Uh, they have a good size checking and savings account, which they're also adding to every year. Uh, and uh, they, 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 these are the resources that will be available to them. Uh, these are the financial resources that they own that will be available to them as they think about this housing decision. And as they think about that, they have to bear in mind a number of other factors. Uh, they have to think ahead. And you may have to think of that ahead. Uh, they may have 20 or 30 or even 40 years to go in their lives. Uh, and they want to know, will the houses that they're considering serve them well over that time? And if that's not the case, how long are they likely to stay in the house that they're considering now? Uh, might they need to take out home equity? And if so, how will they do that? And does the house offer special amenities that will allow them to spend less on other aspects of day-to-day -day living. So all of these factors play into the housing decision. We're going to focus on just the financial aspect, just on the impact that the house that they're considering will have on their financial situation. But all of these other factors are also important. One of the most important of those factors is how many times will you move? When you're thinking ahead, consider why you might want to move. You might want to move for social reasons. You might want to move for comfort reasons. You might want to move for health reasons. And one, one point that I want to emphasize that, that comes out repeatedly in our practice is that major change becomes more and more difficult as people get older, and especially moving gets harder as people get older. So it's easy from the vantage point of late 50s or early 60s to, to plan out a series of changes in your housing. 
as, as you go through retirement, but your perspective at in late 50s or early 60s is very different from what your perspective will be, let's say, in your 70s or in your 80s in terms of how easy it is to get things done. So with all of that as, as a prologue, let's think about the houses that the Robinsons are considering. Uh, and there, there are two options. And I'm, I'm saying that one is Gusto and one is Gusto in, with capital letters and, a, and an exclamation point. So one house is a million one and the other is a million and three quarters. And you can see differences in both the cost of the house here and also in the flows or the annual costs. And those annual costs include real estate taxes, homeowners insurance, major maintenance. And this is an area that people typically significantly underestimate. Uh, uh, it, people tend not to, people tend to think about real estate taxes, that's on the listing. Think about homeowners insurance, that's likely to be on the listing. Uh, utilities, that will be on the listing. Uh, but major maintenance will not be on the real estate listing. But it is uh, a, an unfortunate fact that houses like many other things deteriorate, depreciate. And if you want to maintain the value of the house, if you want to keep it as a place that is pleasurable to live in, and that maintains its resale value, you have to keep up with the major maintenance. And those expenses are likely to be lumpy. You don't incur them on a smooth basis. The roof doesn't need to be replaced every year. The boiler doesn't need to be replaced every year. The kitchen doesn't need to be updated every year. Bathrooms don't need to be updated every year. But when they, when those needs do occur, they, they are significant in size. And they have a, therefore, a significant impact on the total cost of ownership. And we tend that we estimate for our clients major maintenance at 2% of the cost of the, the replacement cost of the dwelling. So that's not the price of the property because the property includes land and land tends not to depreciate, but the dwelling does. So we've, we developed an estimate of 2% of the, of the value of the dwelling and that seems to be working fairly well for, for our clients as, in terms of estimating those costs. So in addition to the purchase cost of the house, we also have the annual cost of the house. And that annual cost is made up of the sum of all of these things. And then the opportunity cost of the investment. And right now with real interest rates being negative, the opportunity cost of the investment is negative. But if interest rates were higher, real interest rates, then the opportunity cost would be positive and that would increase this annual housing cost. So when we're thinking about the cost of these houses, we need to be comparing, and, 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 we're, try, and we're trying to think about that in a, in a flow basis or on an annual basis. These are the numbers that we should be thinking about rather than these numbers, which are also important because we've got to come up with those resources somehow. But having done that, we're also going to be incurring annual housing costs, which are quite substantial. And as the Robinsons think about this, and they think about uh, the impact of the larger house or the much larger house on their living standard, they see that if they just stay where they are, that they could afford to spend $74,000 a year on consumption, that if they buy more house, the million one, they can spend 66,000, but if they buy the one that costs a million 750,000, they can spend only 22,000 a year on consumption, on regular everyday spending. And that's substantially less than the $65,000 a year that they're spending now. So it looks like the much more house is really out of the question. Let's think about what more house costs though. We have the simple numbers here that say, uh, they can they can afford it. They can spend sixty six thousand on day to day living versus sixty five, 
which is what they're currently spending. But how does that, can we put a little bit more flesh on the bones of that, of that difference in affordability? When you spend more on housing, that means that there are fewer resources available for consumption. Uh, and uh, because the annual housing expenses are higher, as we saw, uh, more resources also go to home equity. That means they're, they're taking resources out of an investment account and putting it into the house, and they're planning to leave their house to their kids. So that extra amount planning to go to their kids is less that they can spend on day-to-day -day living. Now, in addition to those uh, direct financial considerations, there are others as well that are special to retirement. First of all, moving to a larger house or just putting more money in, into a house can reduce financial flexibility and it can reduce physical flexibility in the sense that uh, it can be harder to move out of a larger house. It's a bigger commitment. Uh, secondly, putting more financial resources in the house reduces liquid assets. And those, when you're retired, that, that pool of liquid assets is fixed. And if you take money out of it, it goes down and you're not, you're not supplementing it anymore with earned income. And that's a different way of, of thinking about your liquid assets. Uh, in order to afford it, you might need to accelerate retirement account distributions and reduces that. It also reduces that pool of assets more quickly. Uh, and uh, uh, then there are sort of the psychological implications of having all of those resources in the house, uh, being house poor, uh, that the, the much more house that we looked at, the million hundred million seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar house, reduced their ability to spend on everything else a great deal. And I, I say that's the epitome of house poor. But even more house, which is the million one house, reduces their surplus, the, the extra that they have substantially. Let's look at that a little bit more closely. Here's the Robinson's lifetime balance sheet in the case where they buy the house for a million one. And on the left here, we have their lifetime assets. And those assets are independent of the amount that they spend on their house. And those assets include their brokerage account, checking and savings account, their retirement savings, their earnings, because they're not quite ready to retire yet. They have a few more years to, of work to go. Employer contributions to their retirement accounts and their future social security benefits, which are very substantial. Almost half of, uh, let's probably closer to 40% of their total lifetime assets is social security benefits. And their spending on their house is affecting the spending side of the balance sheet. And Housing expenses in this case with the, the maximum house are higher than they would have been if they just stayed where they were and their lifetime sustainable consumption is lower. And notice that their lifetime surplus here is very small. This is sort of their margin for error. And that's so important, I've, I've circled it. Now let's compare this to what their situation would have been if they didn't move to the, to the larger house, if they just stayed where they were. So we're gonna do changes from stay put. And first of all, their lifetime sustainable consumption goes down by almost 230, or about $230,000. And their sustainable consumption, remember goes down to 66,000 from uh, about 74, 75. Um, and their surplus is also down by about 234,000. In fact, it's the same as the reduction in their lifetime sustainable consumption. So where does the money go? Well, it goes into the house, almost entirely into the house. Uh, and there are small differences in, in insurance and in taxes that, that occur because of the, uh, the fact that they're spending more on the house. But basically the money that goes into the house comes out of consumption and it comes out of the surplus, 
because they were spending less than they could have afforded to spend before, but now they're they're in the, in this maximum house. They're spending just about exactly what they can afford to spend. So there's no wiggle room. Now there's one other thing that happens, which is that their terminal real property equity, which is the the value of the of the house that they're going to leave to their kids, is up by about eighty thousand dollars. So the some of the money that goes into the house goes to the kids, as opposed to in maintaining the house and real estate taxes and so forth. So some of these housing expenses here are, are the ones I talked about, the flows, the real estate taxes, and others are money that goes into the, into the house itself, into the equity of, in the house itself. Okay, so the Robinsons really don't like this very much. They're not very happy because the house that's a million one isn't that different from where they are now, which is I think uh, 950,000. Uh, and they wonder, isn't there anything that they can do to, to enjoy a larger house for at least a little, a little while? And well, there is. Suppose that they bought that $1,750,000 house in 2024 and they live there for 10 years and then they downsized to 750,000. And they figure by the time they're in their 80s, they won't really be able to enjoy that larger house as much. So they'll be happy to, to move to a smaller place. And um, this isn't just a financial maneuver. They'll really get 10 years in that larger house. So let's see how that works. And it works pretty well. Uh, it looks like the perfect solution. Uh, notice that if they retire and, and buy that much larger house and then downsize, they can spend $75,000 a year, which is just about the same as what they could spend if they retired and stayed put. So they're, they're going to have just about as much surplus as they would have had before. And um, they weren't sure that they'd get the full benefit out of the much bigger house after 80 anyway. And they've got more surplus, about $10,000 a year worth of surplus or 300,000 in total, and they'll still have uh, $750,000 to leave to Jessica and Theo, their kids, because that's what the house will be worth uh, when, when they leave it to them. So what's not to like? Uh, they get the same consumption amount as in the, in the not move at all. They get lots of surplus, they get more financial flexibility, but there are some practical issues. Uh, it would be a major effort to move at 80, much more effort than to move into the house. Uh, we'll also, we're also going to see that there's substantial financial pressure to move at 80. Uh, and finally, if the value of that big house fell much, that would put the entire plan at risk. We're not gonna look at that beyond just saying that. But I think you can imagine how that might be true. If the if the plan says they're going to sell a house for a million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and then they can only get a million five for it, that's going to take out a lot of the surplus. And all of these risks are not so easy to see at sixty eight, which is where they are now. Okay, so <clears throat> notice what happens here. They buy. So now we're looking at their financial and, and real assets uh, over the rest of their lives. And in the gray, we have their savings and then Jones retirement account, Mark's, and then their home equity. So here's what's gonna happen. They've got the current house, they buy the expensive house here. Um, and, and notice that their home equity drops a lot. The home equity is, large here about a it's almost a million dollars and at this point it drops to sort of 300,000 or so what happens is they take most of the money that was in the home equity and put it into into savings here and they invest it and uh then as but as time proceeds they they've got to put a lot of money into their home equity and they're spending rapidly on those high costs of the house because remember that house costs 70,000 dollars a year to operate so what happens then is as the money starts to run down, it runs down pretty obviously from kind of 2.8 million. And by the time they're in their 
the time they reach 80, uh, it's down to 1.1. That's pretty precipitous. And watch what happens if, if they say, well, we'd like to stay just a couple more years because it's not so easy to, to move. We'll just think about it for a while. They could be out of money at 86, out of financial assets at 86. That's pretty scary. Um, they could extend the, the, make this last a little longer by deferring maintenance, but then they risk not realizing the full sale price when they downsize. So financially, this looks great. And, and uh, in terms of the plan, it looks perfect, but it's important to recognize the other stresses that can be imposed by making a change like this or making a plan like this. Plans can't work just financially. They also have to work in a practical sense as well. Okay, so uh, buying more house implies higher annual costs, but if it's a house that you're planning to hold through the rest of your life, it also means that you're planning a larger bequest. So there's a, there are favorable and unfavorable aspects from a financial perspective. Uh, if you plan to downsize later, it introduces a significant degree of difficulty. And with the Olympics coming up, I think we're going to see, I think in gymnastics, uh, there's, there's degree of difficulty. Uh, and and we, we, we're trying not to introduce financial or, or uh, home management uh, degrees of difficulty uh, with, with our financial plans. And then secondly, uh, when we plan to downsize, it adds investment risk because we're relying on being able to get equity out of the house later in life. And if the financial markets or the housing markets don't cooperate, that can, that can put a real wrench into our plans. And finally, preserving financial flexibility is more important for retirees than it is for people who are still working because retirees have limited adaptability from a financial perspective. They can't work longer like people who are working can because they're not working anymore. All right, so that concludes the discussion and Carrie, I think we're ready for Q&A. Okay, well, Fred has a question um, and this was from one of your earlier slides. Uh, you mentioned the concept of opportunity cost and yes. He, he asked if you could explain what that means. Sure. Let's go back there. Uh, let's see here. Oh, all that animation. Okay. So the the money that you have invested in your house is money that cannot be invested in financial investments. And therefore, you are giving up the financial return on these amounts. Uh, and th the opportunity cost is larger for the larger house than for the smaller house. Because in this case, we could have a $1,750,000 if, if we were renting, let's say, we could have a $1,750,000 invested in and, and we're, determined, we're, we're calculating the opportunity cost based on the rate of return on the risk-free investment. And right now, real interest rates on risk-free investments are negative. So the opportunity cost is actually a little bit negative. We're, we're looking at the difference in expected return between the, the money invested in real estate and the money invested in the risk-free investment. And if the expected rates of return are the same on those two things, if the expected rate of return on the house is the same as the expected rate of return on the risk-free investment, then that opportunity cost is zero. That net opportunity cost is zero. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is something um, I've been wondering about. A, a lot of times you'll see uh, that there's a rule of thumb about um, your income has to be X amount to be able to afford this this house. I mean, is there actually, a, you know, a, a, an amount of income that you need to be able to afford 
you know, each house? How, how is right. that determined if there is one? Right. Uh, there are, uh, I think, two ways to think about that. Uh, one of them is in terms of flows and the other is in terms of stocks, right? Flows are expenditures that we make every month. Stocks are sort of lifetime values. So let's think of it in terms of flows for a minute. And flows are, we're, we're seeing right here. And the, the appropriate flow comparison is not spending versus income, but rather how much can you afford to spend on everything else? And is that enough for you? So regardless of what your income is, if you can afford to spend, and afford I mean in a lifetime basis now, not on a cash flow basis. So and if, if you did this long-term plan and, and the plan, the analysis suggested that you could afford to keep spending what you like to spend on day-to-day -day living, even if you spent that amount, the amount in question on a house, then you can afford it. And, and uh, the, the annual cost as a percentage of your annual income might be anything, depending upon what your assets are. Because when you think about just income, you're ignoring assets, mm -hmm. right? And, and it may be that you're, when you buy the house that you're taking assets from one form and turning them into another form of assets. And that may be quite affordable, even if your income is low. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, if you have small assets, that, that, that you, you might not be able really to afford a, a house, to, to afford buying a house because the, 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 I guess the best way to say it is that it's not just your income that matters. It's all, it's also your assets. Mm -hmm. Those are both important. And, and unfortunately there's no simple rule that compares what you can spend on the house with what you have in income or with what, what you have in assets, because remember assets are a lump, they're a stock mm -hmm. and income is a flow. It comes in every month. And the assets are, this is something that I've, if, if there's one big point about buying a house versus, um, and how much you can afford, it's that the house is a stock and you're spending a large chunk to, to buy it. And that chunk is com comparable to your assets. And if you want to translate it into income, then you kind of have to translate your whole um, all of your expenditures into income. You, you want to be either thinking all about flows or all about stocks because comparing stocks and flows is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's another question from Chris. Would it be preferable to rent since the majority of annual housing costs are typically covered by a landlord? Uh, the the well, but, but first of all, you could you could go back and watch our webinar from last week where we talked about that in right. extensively. But but uh, the short answer is that when you own the house, you are the landlord. You've we've kind of eliminated the the, the middle person here. Um, but one way or another, those costs have to be covered. Either you cover them yourself as the owner of the house, or you cover them through the rent that you pay to the landlord. And it's, it's basically equivalent. Okay. Um, well, this is a, um, a sort of a, a, a different facet of the question that I ask. If there's a rule of thumb relative to one's net worth that can act as a starting point in identifying how much to spend on a home at, in retirement. Well, let's let's look at let's look at our lifetime balance sheet as a as a way of thinking about that. In general, when you're thinking about your lifetime wealth, your your wealth is the left hand side of the balance sheet. Mm 
And that includes your tax advantage savings, your non-tax advantage savings, your any earnings that you have coming uh, if you haven't yet retired, uh, and then your social security benefits, which are frequently a large asset uh, and larger than people tend to think. And the, 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 the question, a way of phrasing the question might be, well, for somebody who's got 4.8 million in this case in lifetime assets, what's the right amount that they should be spending on housing expenses versus on sustainable, cons on, on consumption, right? Day-to-day -day living. And when you, when you pose the question that way, I think that, that it becomes clearer that there's no simple answer to this. Some people really like houses and they really like living in nice houses and they're willing to uh, drive less expensive cars and, and uh, take fewer vacations and um, uh, you know, hang around home because they got a nice house and, uh, and they've put a lot of money into the house. Uh, and, and I shouldn't say a nice house. Lots of people have nice houses. They've got an expensive house, and because, but they like having the expensive house. And I, I think back to all of the attributes that we talked about um, that, that make a house expensive. You know, is it a, does it have great finishes? Is it in a, in a, in a Tony neighborhood? Is it bigger? Um, uh, does it have, uh, 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 expensive appliances in the kitchen, all of those things, right? Which influence your quality of life, but in, but people have different preferences about that sort of thing. And the, 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 the one thing that you, one rule that you have to satisfy is you can't spend more than you have. So you can't have a really expensive house and spend a lot on consumption and not run out of money, mm -hmm. right? But there's, there's, no, there's no reason why you couldn't spend half and half or one third, two thirds. As long as you're happy with the, the amount that you're spending and as long as you're happy with the house, that's fine. And there, there's, there's no, um, I'm not aware of any psychological research that says it's psychologically dangerous to spend a certain, you know, a certain percentage of your wealth on, on housing or, or smaller than a certain percentage on housing. Uh, and it's, it's also going to vary depending upon where you live. Uh, I mean, regionally where you live. Uh, because some regions, some regions of the country, housing is very inexpensive, and in other areas of the country, housing is very expensive. And I haven't looked at it. I should. It would be interesting to look at. But my suspicion is that people spend different percentages of their income on housing depending upon where they live and whether housing is expensive or not. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. Um, let's see. Are there any suggestions on not being able to obtain a mortgage to, to buy a new residence because of the drop in income during retirement? Ideally, would uh, he, this person would want to use proceeds of the sale of the old house for the new house, but timing may not line up. Assets don't seem to count much for mortgage and IRAs cannot be used as collateral. Ah. Uh. Uh, IRAs cannot be used as collateral, but IRA distributions count as income. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, it, and this is not an area in which I have a, a lot of expertise. I, I, I will say that if, if a large fraction of your assets is, is in retirement accounts, that tends to be a little less flexible than financially flexible than having uh, uh, more of your assets in, in after-tax accounts. Uh, uh, my sense is that if you are um, uh, not stretching 
financially to buy the home that you're trying to move to that you can get a bank to work with you on if you if you sort of walk through the entire set of transactions that you're trying to undertake um, that you may be able to work something out with the bank uh, you can you can certainly get a home equity line of credit on your current home and borrow some of the money that you might need to buy the new home uh, so you can you can access the equity in your current home in that way uh, you can't access all of it but you can access a, a, a good sized chunk uh, so there's there's more uh, there are a variety of ways to um, uh, to make this work there is there is uh, one additional approach that requires a lot of caution and a lot of care and constant you know staying very close to uh, the various financial institutions involved but here is here is how this works if you have um, uh, suppose that you have the, the the purchase and the sale lined up in pretty close proximity so the purchase of the new house is let's say 30 days before the sale of the old house will occur. So you've got a 60 day or sorry, a 30 day window and you're short. You can do the following. You can take the money out of the IRA, take a distribution from the IRA for the difference pay the difference. So, so suppose, so let's use some numbers here. Suppose that you're buying a half million dollar house and you have a half million dollar house, but you have no taxable assets and you couldn't arrange the, the home equity line of credit that I was talking about, but you have $3 million in your IRA. You can take, so, and remember that the, the, the purchase and the sale are, six, are 30 days apart. So you take the distribution from the IRA, you buy the new house, you sell the old house 30 days later, and you take the $500,000 that you got from selling the old house, and you put it back in the IRA. And you can do that as long as it's no more than 60 days apart. It's called a Wait, rollover. No penalty? No penalty, but it's got to be done in 60 days. Mm -hmm. If you do it six, on the 61st day, the distribution is you can no longer do a rollover and the distribution of half a million dollars is taxable mm. and you've got a big income year. So you, 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 this is, you need to have all of everything lined up to make this work well, but it can't, it, but it, if, if, if things are lined up in that way, then it works very well. Okay. Um, Anna asks, um, many people develop limitations later in life. Do you factor in added costs for health uh, with health expenses or how do you account for this in the plan? So yes, the, 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 uh, your plan should include health expenses, right? And we have those in, in here on this, in the special and insurance expenses. So we have, uh, we factor in uh, Medicaid Part B premiums. We factor in Medicare supplemental premiums. We factor in, but but if you have specific concerns, you can you can put in extra mm -hmm. for that as well. Um, Beth asks, in the scenario you presented, where did the money for the more expensive home come from? Was it mortgaged or from savings? Yes, it was mortgaged. Right. Okay. So let's let's show that. right here. Okay. So you see that this is home equity here in the existing house. And then they bought, when they buy the new house here, notice that their financial assets go up. And that's because the mortgage in the new house is much larger than the mortgage in the old house. Mm -hmm. So in effect, they, they, they took cash out of the first house, the equity in the first house, right? Put it in their financial assets. And so they had to borrow the extra. And I think in the plan, I put 20% down. So on the, I put 300, I think $350,000 down. Yes, that would be right. Right. 
Okay. Um, okay. Uh, how do we do the lifetime balance sheet? Do you use Maxify as a tool? And are there any guidelines on estimating the major and minor maintenance items? Okay. There are a lot of questions there. A lot of questions. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Let's see if if we can if we can take them all. So, and you check me, Carrie. Okay. So, and I'm going to take them out of order just to make it a little more difficult for you. So, yes, we use Maxify, right? Which is a piece of software that uh, looks at one's entire life and income and expenditures over entire life, and it allows us to. And, and in fact in the software itself, it produces a lifetime balance sheet. So that's where the lifetime balance sheet comes from. The lifetime balance sheet I've showed you is a little different from the one that Maxify produces. Uh, but, but they have a lifetime, it, it, the software has in it a lifetime balance sheet. And you can, you can use it just about the same as I use this one. Um, so major maintenance. Two per, we use 2% of the value of the dwelling. So that means uh, in order to do that, you have to take the property appraisal and, and at, at least estimate how much of it is land and how much of it is dwelling. And you might be able to do that by, uh, uh, certainly the, the current owner uh, has a replacement cost value uh, for the house in their homeowner's insurance. And we always estimate what that would be. You, you want to put something in, even if it's not perfect, having a number in there is, is helpful. In terms of the minor maintenance, um, we include in there things that uh, 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 some people some people cut their own grass. Other people have a servant, a lawn care service. Some people shovel their own driveway. Other people have, uh, 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 have a service to do that. Some people do their own um, minor electrical and plumbing work. Other people hire a plumber and an electrician. And um, a, a way to do this would be simply to take, uh, if, if you own a home now and you're thinking about buying another one, you, you take the cost for your home and then you adjust it proportionally for the value of the new home. So if, you're, if you live in a half million dollar house and you're thinking about buying a million dollar house, you double it. Okay, so, but you're, you don't, <clears throat> you're not necessarily going to be 100% accurate, but you don't want to put in zero. Right. And that 2% is an annual cost. The two percent right. is an annual cost. That's right. When people it's, are asking, that's that. So that says that says in effect that you have to replace the house entirely every fifty years. Right. Two percent okay. a year times fifty is is a hundred percent. And we develop that estimate by uh, looking at uh, uh, the the amount of time that various components of the house lasted before they needed to be replaced. And we and the two percent is an average of the of the uh, depreciation rate across all the components of the house. Um, let's see. Okay, <laughs> this is an interesting one. Uh, due to um, in order to purchase my next and last house, I plan to take out a thirty-year mortgage. I don't expect ever to pay it off um, because this person doesn't expect uh, to, to be, live 30 years. To live 30 more years. Um, right. um, in, in order to have, you know, to be a little more liquid and not have all my right. assets tied up in the house, right. are there pitfalls to this plan? Are there pitfalls to this plan? Um, Well, uh, I guess that, that the biggest pot potential pitfall that I can see is that uh, it might be that uh, someone might be tempted to 
take the money that they got out, right, or that the, the money borrowed for financial flexibility and invest it. And if they invest it and they invest a good percentage of it in stocks and stocks do very poorly, then they may end up with a mortgage and much less financial flexibility than they anticipated. That would be the biggest uh, uh, potential problem that I could see. Uh, there, are, there are other um, uh, other options that are foreclosed or, or severely limited by doing something like that. For example, if, if you thought that you might at some point want to take a reverse mortgage, the amount that you could take on the reverse mortgage would be less. And the reverse mortgage has uh, certain advantages if you are planning to stay in the house for your entire life. Um, and, uh, and you want to take equity out. It has certain advantages over a standard mortgage. So those are worth thinking about. Well, I'm, I, I don't want to go into reverse mortgages here in this discussion, but uh, because it's a very complicated topic. But reverse mortgages have certain advantages for retirees that standard mortgages do not. They're more expensive too, but it's, it's worth thinking about it carefully. Um, so someone asks, you mentioned risk-free investment for comparison. Are you considering tips or government bond? I'm considering tips. Okay. And that stands for, for those? TIP stands for Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. And they are treasury bonds with where the, the uh, face amount adjusts for inflation, adjusts to replace inflation. So if you buy a bond for $1,000 and it's a 10-year bond, and in 10 years, the price level has doubled, the bond matures at 2000 Um. This person says, seems like a retiree uh, would be diverting money for a down payment and paying expenses via portfolio income outside of initial down payment. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding the, the uh, phrasing. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't really understand. What this so maybe they could repeat the question. Could we go, maybe go on to another and, and perhaps come back? Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, perhaps, Nancy, if you could rephrase that, uh, then, then we can ask that question. Um, okay, let's, there's more here. Uh, on one of the last slides, the home equity dropped between age 68 and around age 73. And why did that happen? I think that's, that's here, right? Here's the mm -hmm. home equity getting smaller from here's 68 and here's 71 and the home equity is in blue and it gets smaller. And the reason is that this is the time when they're selling their current house and buying the new one. And so they're taking uh, and, and this, this home was mortgage free and this home has a very large mortgage on it. And so they took a lot of the equity out of the home that, the, that they sold and put it into their investable assets, their savings, and they took a large mortgage. And then as they pay down the mortgage and also as they incur those housing expenses, their financial assets drop very quickly. Okay, uh, one, uh, I can see one more. Um, how do you calculate replacement cost? Is it simply square footage times cost per square foot in your area? That's a way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a, a way to do it. Uh, when we're doing plans, we tend to ask, the, uh, ask for the replacement cost as reflected on the insurance policy. And we're figuring that the insurance company has a pretty good sense of what replacement costs are in the area. But if you're thinking about buying a home for which you don't have an insurance policy, then you can, 
you could certainly use a uh, square foot times dollar per square foot if you can get a good sense of what that uh, uh, cost per square foot would be. Again, when we're doing a plan like this, we're, we recognize that we're, we can't be 100% accurate, but we're going to be, but doing an estimate is, is better than and doing a careful estimate is going to be better than uh, just winging it. And uh, the, the, what we're most concerned about is leaving important costs out. So leaving major maintenance out, for example, is a, would be a big mistake. Um, uh, and not uh, not incorporating all of the costs is is going to make it more likely that you're going to think that you could afford something that you might not be able to afford. That's the, that, and that's another reason why we're trying to do things on a lifetime basis. Because again, when you do it on a lifetime basis, then you're you're thinking about everything in summary terms, in lifetime terms, rather than comparing a stock, which is that big lump you're going to pay for the house, to a flow. Right, and we ah, and when we do that, we tend to forget all the flows. Right, so you you look at the mortgage payment, you say, well, I can afford the mortgage payment, and the mortgage payment's got my real estate expense uh, taxes and my insurance premium in it. I'm done, right? But no, you're not, because that you've got to maintain that house, and those maintenance costs are a large fraction of the total. Um, let's go back here. Here, okay. So the major maintenance is more than a third of this total cost. Major maintenance is twenty six thousand dollars, and this is sixty seven thousand, right? So it's of the order of forty percent. It's it's so if you leave that out, if you leave major maintenance cost major maintenance costs out of the cost of housing, you're going to significantly underestimate the total cost of owning the house. And that's a big mistake. Right. Uh, Nancy did come back. Um, she said she was trying to find the rules of thumb when considering how much to put as a down payment and how much to expect from a portfolio for the remaining flow expenses going Got forward. It. Got it. Okay. And and uh, Carrie, this should be our last question because sure. you have to close at four o'clock. Okay. Um, Nancy, the, the there. There is not a good rule of thumb here. Uh, and, and in general, we discourage people from trying to estimate what return they're going to get on their investments because the, a mortgage payment is, a, is risk-free for the bank, right? You owe the mortgage payment every month and you owe that interest payment and that principal payment every month. The, the money that you will earn on your investment portfolio is not risk-free. It's very risky. You don't know what it will be. And, and because it's risky, there's no safe number to place on it, no predictable number to place on it, unless you use the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate is the only one we know that we can count on. And right now, the risk-free rate is negative. So we, in general, do not advise people to take a mortgage, borrow money, and then invest it as a profit-making exercise. I think that's very risky to do. Okay, so I think we're, we're going to have to uh, stop it here. Um, let's, let's move to the... end here, and we'll talk about, and I will close out and say, uh, thank you for coming today. Today, we talked about how much house can we afford. Next time, on the 25th of August, we're going to talk about should we buy a vacation house? Uh, and then on the 8th of September, should we downsize or dream size? And in October, can you count on the value of your home? Thank you very much for coming. And here's all the places you can find us. And this webinar will be available on our website in a few days. Thanks again for coming. <laughs>